So good morning or good afternoon everyone. Welcome to APNIC eLearning Web class. This is uh, our weekly e-learning sessions that we do um, for the members of the internet community and we do cover like four courses. Each course runs for one hour and this is the second one that we are doing. The topic that is assigned for this is an introduction to autonomous system number. Now just a bit of housekeeping first. Today is the 26th of March in 2014. It's already 12.30 in the afternoon from Brisbane in Australia where I'm broadcasting this class. Let me also introduce myself. My name is Cheryl Hermoso. I work as a training officer for APNIC. And as you can see there, these are the topics that we do cover. We do workshops face-to-face -face and also tutorial type of sessions. And e-learning is provided for free for members of the internet community that cannot attend any of those face-to-face -face sessions. Now also, just a reminder that there will be a brief survey towards the end. And it's pretty standard because we want to get your input when it comes to the quality of the class that's been delivered and if you have any suggestions for future courses that we should probably introduce to um, um to the to the class anyway um with that um let's have a look at what we are planning to cover now it's it's basic things like um it's an introduction to an asm so what is basically what's an autonomous system and what do we use the autonomous system number four? Of course, that is the number assigned, a unique number assigned for auto autonomous system. So how is it used? Why do we need it? When do we need it? How do we get them? How do we go about requesting those AS numbers? Or do we have like public and private um, ASNs like we do in IP addresses? And of course, what do we use these ASNs for? Of course, they're used for routing. Okay, so we'll have a brief look at how we represent routing policies, okay? How we use ASNs in in um in the AS path and all that, okay? We will look at the two types of AS numbers, 16 bits and 32 bits, and hopefully we'll have enough time to look at the differences between these two and how they communicate or how they interact with each other. All right? So that is the plan. We'll start start with autonomous system number. What is an autonomous system number? So that's the basis of this entire session. It's essentially a unique number, okay? It's a unique identifier for IP networks, or more specifically, it's a unique identifier for an autonomous system. So when you talk about autonomous system, think of it as a network, a collection of routers, network devices that belongs to a group belongs to maybe one ISP, maybe it's one enterprise network that has a presence on the internet. Maybe they want to get traffic, maybe they have their own IP addresses and they are announcing those prefixes to the internet, okay? Maybe they have servers, maybe they have like different services. So they needed to be accessible, okay? So their IP addresses should be on the global routing table and there has to be a way for the routing processes to know how to direct the traffic, so to speak, or to direct the packet to get to, let's say, network A or ISP A, okay? And with that, we use routing protocols. And routing protocols, specifically exterior routing protocols, such as BGP, uses this autonomous system numbers to identify different networks. So as you can see, an autonomous system number is important, okay? It's important because it uniquely identifies an autonomous system. So one has a unique number amongst all the, say, 400,000, okay, different networks out there. So what is an autonomous system? So as I've said, an autonomous system, you can think of it as just a network. But when we talk about networks, it's vague. It can be a small LAN, it can be a WAN, it can be a MAN, it can be, let's say, comprised of a few computers, it can be comprised of okay, a vast range of uh, network devices, routers, switches, servers, and all that. So, um, the, um, what do you call it, say, um, the grouping is, is a bit vague. But when you talk about an autonomous system, we are now identifying okay, a group of these network devices belonging to a single okay, proprietor 
or to a single group. Okay, there are two things that identify an AS. Okay, an AS is basically um, the acronym for an auto autonomous system. So there are two things that identify that. One is it's usually under a single ownership, a single trust, or administrative control. So one organization that handles everything about that network. And with that leads us to the second um, property, which is it normally has the same routing policies. So if you think about it, let's, let's get an example. Maybe it's a service provider network. So a big ISP where you get your inter internet connectivity, a lot of home users, a lot of say enterprise users go to the ISP to get their internet connectivity. Now this ISP can have maybe um, a pop, a, a, pre a presence, okay? Um, um, maybe a small group in one region, another small group in another region, a big network or core network in the, um, in the city. But all of these are connected to each other, and you can consider that as belonging to one AS. Because again, it's under a single ownership, under a single administrative control, and it can have the same routing policy. Okay, you have their own private network there. When you have a customer, this customer connects to the ISP. Now this customer technically doesn't belong to that network, and so it is outside. It can be considered as a different AS. So it definitely will have its own set of rules, its own set of policies, which may be different from the ISP's policy. When we say policy here, we're talking about what type of traffic will be allowed to my network, okay? what are the filters that I'm going to put in, what are the networks that I can, I can now access. Okay? So basically, you're controlling the incoming and outgoing traffic. Okay, by um, adding some of these policies. And those policies are, of course, based on your business needs. Okay, so as I've said, when we talk about autonomous system here, the customer network may possibly be, or I think it, it should be, belonging to a different autonomous system. Okay, your service provider network is also another autonomous system. Okay, so that's how, that's how we define an AS. And each autonomous system, as we've said in the previous slide, will be using a unique number, an autonomous system number, and it is unique all throughout. It's unique all throughout the um, all throughout the internet. Now, how do autonomous systems work? So basically, it's all about um, announcing prefixes. Okay, it's like this is going back to routing because an autonomous system and essentially an autonomous system number is the basis or the you can say that like a fundamental unit when we talk about exterior routing protocols okay um bgp uses autonomous systems a lot um the way that bgp talks to each other okay is basically identified by these asns and the way it identifies the path going to let's say if you're sending a packet going to a specific ip address okay it will know the path by referring to these autonomous system numbers. So let's just have a quick look at um, a basic example here of how it works. Uh, when you talk about routing, it's all about announcing prefixes so that traffic will come to you. Okay, I have, I, I belong to this address. I have to announce that address so that everybody on the internet will know how to get to me. Because when I announce my address, when I announce my prefix, when I announce my IP address, then it will be added into the routing tables of the other networks. So in an autonomous system network, um, such as possibly um, here, you have routers that what we call is essentially they're BGP speakers, but um, they're the ones that talk with each other and they have a routing table. This routing table contains all these prefixes. So let's just say here, you have AS1 all the way up to AS7, how does AS1 know about AS4, which is right on the other side here? Okay, again, it has something to do with um, announcing your prefixes. So let's just say AS4 here has direct connectivity, has peering with other networks. It is peering directly with AS6. It is peering directly with AS3. So AS4 now, okay, will announce its prefixes going to AS6 or AS3 
So as you can see from AS6, it has added a route entry, okay, that leads to AS4, okay. It has an entry in his routing table that says that for this type of IP address for these types of traffic, then I can forward it to AS4, okay. And then from AS6, these are learned routes. It will be forwarded to, let's say, AS7 because it's peering with AS7, okay. So now AS7 knows about of course, knows about five, it knows about six, and it has a default, a default route that tells him um, how to get to the rest of um, the rest of the network or what will be the default. Let's just say maybe here the default will be AS6, and if he forward the packet to this AS6, AS6 knows how to get to AS4, right? Also from AS7, he can now announce that AS5. From AS5, it can be announced to AS1. So as you see, from AS5, it has direct connections to AS1, 7, 2, and 3. So it has all of that. It, it basically has a complete picture of the entire networks. If he receives a packet that goes to AS1, he knows that, hey, I have, I have this route entry. I can forward that to AS1. If I have a route entry that goes to AS2, I can forward that accordingly going to AS3. If I have something that goes to AS4, I can go via AS3 to AS4, things like that. So that is essentially how your autonomous systems work. You have these routers that talk to each other, exchanges routing information about the different autonomous systems and how they learn from them. Okay? These will be forwarded to their other peers, to the, the other networks that they're directly connected with, so that they also now have an idea or they know how to forward packets. So again, from AS1, if I receive a traffic that goes to AS4, I know that I can forward that either from AS to AS5 or going to AS2, okay? And then it will then find its way using its own routing table to get my packet into AS4. That's how autonomous systems work. Um, that's how you identify different networks and that's how it's useful to, um, to, to our routing protocols such as PGP. So why do we need an AS? Well, why do we need an AS number, sorry? An ASN basically is needed um, because of the reasons that I've shown you in the previous slide, which is to basically forward the traffic okay, to learn about these different routes. Now, when do we need an ASN? Now, not every situation calls for an autonomous system number, or more specifically, I would say that not all of them requires public autonomous system numbers. So think about IP addresses for, for a second. And in IP addressing, you have private and public addresses. In private addresses, it's only used within your local network, but you needed a public address to get to the rest of the internet, correct? You need a public um, um, IP address as well, if you have, let's say, a server that you want to be accessible from the rest of the internet, okay? So similarly here, if you have the setup that, well, I remember I told you about a setup earlier where you have an ISP, you have a customer, and this customer connects directly, has peering with the ISP because he's subscribing from that ISP. Now, do we always need to have an AS number for this? Of course, it needed an AS number because you are going to implement okay, a routing policy. Okay, You are going to use a routing protocol to implement that routing policy. So there has to be um, an AS number Okay to be used by that customer and an AS number to be used by the ISP in this case. But let's go to the a usage of either a public or a private AS number. In this case, your customer is connecting with the ISP, correct? Um, but um, this peering, okay, um, is it essential? To, for, for that customer to be reachable from the rest of the internet. Maybe not. Maybe that customer only has the ISP connecting to the ISP and all of his traffic goes to that ISP. So it's his default route, okay? All his traffic goes to and from the ISP. So in this case, you don't exactly need to have a public autonomous system number. You are not multi-homing. In this case, our customer is not multi-homing. 
What do we mean by multi-homing? If you have multiple connections, multiple connectivity, multiple peering with other networks, okay, that are not your own, okay, let's just say you have two upstream providers, or aside from your upstream provider, you're also peering with an exchange point, then that is using multi-homing. So in this case, you need a public AS number. If you are multi-homing, okay, you have different connectivity to different providers, and you are going to implement routing policies to these external peers. Okay, so by the way, if you want to read more through that, that is in RFC 1930. And if you're going to request for your AS number, it will be through okay, the guidelines that are set on RFC 1930. Now, if you want to request for an AS number, there are some eligibility rules. I've mentioned that in the previous slide, which is essentially to be multi-homing. If you're not multi-homing yet, then you might want to do that in the next month. Does that also indicate how to set up the BGP routes? Um, does that also indicate how to set up the BGP routes? Essentially, when you request for your AS number, you have to inform um, which will be your peers. So yes, um, essentially, you need um, the AS numbers of the peers, at least two of those peers, Okay, when you request for your AS number, and those peering essentially affects or defines your BGP rat. So yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. So all right, going back to this. Um, to the, okay, we got a four byte AS and we'll inform our peers, which is okay. Then I need to set up our BGP routing. Yes, obviously, yes, that's just the setup. If you already have that, you need to um, uh, just let your peers know um, and also check with them if they're using 4-byte or 2-byte AS numbers. Okay, now, if you are going to request for um, an AS number, there are um, different ways to do that. Okay, yeah. let's just say that you have, of course, met all the eligibility rules and we're talking about public AS numbers here. Okay, the AS numbers that uh, you will yeah, you will be using with your, for your BGP routes. Um, the request process is quite simple, but there are two ways to do the request. One is directly going to an I, uh, to a registry. So you come to APNIC, if you're an APNIC member, you request for your AS number, just as this is the way that you uh, request for your AS number, perhaps, uh, I'm sorry, just the way you request your IP addresses, okay? It's the same thing. So you go, go to your My APNIC account, you log in, you do the request from there. And that is if you are an APNIC member. However, if you are not, you can always go to your upstream provider and they can do the request because most ISPs are APNIC members. So these ISPs can now do the request for you. Now, if you're the ISP, you come to APNIC and just say that I'm requesting for this AS number in behalf of my customer. So that is a right. Okay. However, there's also a um, an idea of portability and non-portability with AS numbers. So if you request directly from APNIC, then that is a portable AS number, meaning that if you are going to, let's say, change your ISPs in the future, then you can keep that AS number. You don't have to make any changes in your BGP configuration and all that. However, if it, you requested that from your upstream provider, of course, there is an inherent um, agreement there between yourself and the ISP that if you're not going to use their services anymore, you have to return all the resources that were given to you through them, okay, and request for another set from your new upstream provider. So yes, you have to give it back to your upstream and that ISP will have to return that AS number to the pool, okay? Now, the request process is easy in either way. Of course, you'll have to check if you are going to use four byte AS numbers, okay? First and foremost, that's because um, by default, APNIC and most of the other RIRs nowadays are giving four byte ASNs by default. 
If you have an older router that doesn't have support for 4 byte, or maybe your iOS doesn't have support for 4 byte ASN, then okay, you can request for 2 bytes. However, if you don't specify it, you will be given a 4 byte ASN. So this has started in around 2009. 2009, actually, it was still optional. The default is 2 byte, but starting from 2010, um, 4 byte is not the default, but you can always still request for a two byte ASM if you need that. Okay. Um, sorry, what's, hang on. Um, we can miss this bit if you like, I've already got an ASM. All right, so you already have an ASM. Transferring of ASM should also be easy. It's the same as in IP addresses. You can actually also do um, a transfer with other, other RIRs. It's, Specifically, if they already have um, a similar uh, a similar policy with them, okay. So that is with requesting an AS number. I've already mentioned about portable and non-portable, okay. So if you're going to request, of course, it depends whether you request it from APNIC or from your upstream providers. That will be portable. If it's from your upstream providers, that will be non-portable. As I've said, um, normally you will get a four-byte ASM. Okay, and not to buy. Now, here is a simple example of um, routing policy. How do you represent routing policy when it comes to um, um, when you use AS or when you when you create your your basically your policies? So here we have just a very very simple example: AS one and AS two. As I've said, for you to get traffic, okay, and if you have a uh, an IP address block. You have to announce these blocks, okay, in order for you to get a, a, a packet. I sorry, a, a traffic, okay. So packet flow, okay, is always in the opposite direction as the routing flow. So here, AS1 is announcing, okay, it's announcing its prefix to AS2. AS2 must accept this. So announcement is not the end of it. It has to be accepted by your peer, okay, depending on their own policy. If they do, they do accept, then they know it will be added onto your routing table and you can be reached using AS2. So again, um, AS1 announces, routing flow is there, packet flow will be going this way. And if AS2 wanted to be reached by AS1, AS1 now must announce his presence to AS, uh, AS2 must announce his presence to AS1, so AS1 can now forward that. So this is how it will look like. AS1 announcing to AS2, AS2 accepting from AS1, AS2 announcing to AS1, and AS1 accepting from AS2. Pretty simple. So this is how it would look like in RPSL, or the Routing Policy Specifications Language. So it's a series of import and export statements. You have to specify your peers. So in this case, what, what am I going to accept from AS2? Okay, so this is for AS1's configuration. So this is a very simple one, as I've said, in which case we are accepting everything from AS2. So AS2 may be announcing many prefixes, not just his own. He's originating his own prefix, but also announcing prefixes that he has learned from other, other, other peers. So in this case, everything, all of that, is going to be accepted. So import statement, anything from AS2, accept, and then we have a preference number. So if you have a lot of import statements, okay, you have priorities, you have preferences. For export, we have uh, we are announcing everything to AS2, and the same goes for the RPSL for AS2. So import statement will be at, from AS1, I'm accepting everything, um, going to AS1, I'm announcing my own prefix. So that's how it will look like. Actually, when you do your request, which you've already done, um, you have to specify um, these import and export statements as well. Okay, I've already mentioned the, about the preference. The lower the value, the more preferred the route. So if you have many of these import statements, okay, you specify the preferences accordingly and the lower value will have more preference. All right, so another example here, just a little more uh, complicated, I think, compared to the previous one. So we have AS4, okay, and he, he is connected to AS123. You can think of it as 
three different autonomous systems, but to simplify things, we'll just consider it as one from here because he's only seen as one from AS4. And then AS4 also has connections appearing with AS5 and AS10. So in this example, AS4 is a transit provider. Okay, he gives transit between AS5 and AS10. So he should allow traffic uh, from AS5 going to AS10 and traffic coming from AS10 going to AS5. Okay, for AS123, he only gives local routes, meaning that does he have to announce these prefixes going to AS123? Possibly not. So how does it look like in RPSL? Okay, it should be something like this. Okay, you have an import statement. For anything coming from AS123, you accept it. Okay, for anything coming from AS5, you also accept it. Anything coming from AS10, you also accept it. However, how about my export statements? Now, what do I announce to AS123? Again, we're only giving local, okay, local connections, local routes to AS4. So if I'm originating, originating a prefix from AS4, I will announce that to AS123. But I will not give, I will not forward any of the prefixes announced from AS5 and AS10, right? So for my export statement going to AS123, I'm only announcing my own prefix, only AS4. Going to AS5 and AS10, I'm announcing two things. I have to announce my local, local routes, of course, okay, AS4, and I have to announce AS10 because, again, we have transit between AS5 and AS10 in this example. And same goes for the export statement to AS10. We are announcing two, we're announcing AS5 and also AS4, okay? Now, this is still a very simple example, but you see the point, like from the uh, first example to this, it already gets a bit complicated. And just imagine how it's gonna be with thousands. Um, actually, right now, when you look at the global routing table, the number of autonomous system, I think, closely reaches about 50,000. So think about 50 autonomous networks, 50 autonomous systems out there. And if you're going to create rules or policies, okay, about all of these prefixes or all of these autonomous systems, then that's really not feasible. That is a very complicated thing to do, okay? Just notice that this export statement, this is not a path, meaning that to get to AS10, it's not like you have to have to AS4 and then to AS5. That's a different thing that it's called AS path. But in this example, in RPSL, this is not an AS path. All right. So given that you already know the import and export statements, this is how it will look like for your AS number entry in the WHOIS database. The WHOIS database is a public database that lists down all the resources, IP addresses, and autonomous system numbers. And an autonom object is actually how we represent an autonomous system number in the WHOIS database. So AS, ASN is autonom. This has to be unique. You provide um, for which it belongs to, um, a brief description into that. And the important ones are, of course, your import and export statement that you have to specify. Again, you need to have at least two, uh, two peers in order for this to, um, to be accepted. Okay, in this case, we have AS4777. We are accepting prefixes coming from three networks. Okay, AS2500, 2524, and 2514. That means we are either getting, maybe, maybe there are upstream providers, or maybe they are our, uh, our peers, okay? So we have direct peering with this three, and we are also announcing prefixes going to them, okay? Notice that we have a default. Default is AS2500, which means that this must be my main uplink or my main upstream provider, okay? All of my... Um, traffic that I don't know where to send, okay? Maybe it's not announced. Notice we're accepting all prefixes from 
2524 and 2514 as well. But if those prefixes are not announced to us, and so we have no idea where to send it, then we will send the packet to AS2500. All right, so it actually gives us some good information about our policies for, for our networks if you only look at the Autumn object, okay? Other things that are important there, are of course, your contact, contact details, administrative contact, and technical uh, contacts, which will help us, okay, if we are maybe trying to troubleshoot, um, 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 say, a BGP problem when it comes to, say, some routes, like um, one of our customers is not getting or cannot reach particular network, then we can use this information okay, and communicate with whoever is a technical or administrative contact for this autonomous system number. Okay. Now, um, two types of representation of AS number. It's 2-byte and 4-byte, of course. So 2-byte is from 0 to 65535, that's 16 bits written in decimal form. 4-byte AS numbers is, you can think of it as an extension, okay? An extension of the 2-byte ASN, which is now up to 32 bits. So the entire range is from 0 all the way to 4.3 billion, okay? However, just to distinguish between 2-byte and 4-byte, okay? Uh, when we talk about 4-byte, four four we normally just refer to the ones that are not included in the 2-byte space. So anything from 65536 all the way to 4.3 billion. Now, there are two ways in which we can write down or represent an AS number. It's either using AS plane or AS dot. AS plane is simple. You just use the same, same thing you do with 2-byte. So if you have a... Um, 32-bit uh, number, you just convert that into decimal and represent it as such. However, some people find it difficult, or maybe not difficult, but just um, like, like you're representing a very big number here. So up to four something billion. So they thought, why not use AS dot? So in that case, you will still have the range from 0 to 65535. But in this case, what we did was split up the 32-bit range, the 32-bit number, into two. You have the higher bits and the lower bits, and then convert that into decimal accordingly. And then put a dot in, in between that, okay? So that's why it's called an AS dot representation. So see here, this is 65536. Essentially, when you write that down in binary format, the higher bits is all ones. The first 16 bits would be all ones. And the last 16 bits will be 0. So when you write that down in AS dot format, that is 1.0. Okay? And the maximum will be, of course, all 1s. Okay? Even if you subdivide them and then uh, represent it in decimal, that's 65535 for both higher and lower bits. So 65535.65535. Okay? Now, we don't actually recommend the use of AS dot in our region, partly because of the difficulty it um, presents when you have, let's say you have routing policies and how you implement those routing policies if you have many prefixes, if you have many, um, many, many route entries, then normally we use groupings or um, based on the group groupings, we set um, um, maybe, we, we set, we use regular expressions to identify or, or to basically to create filters for each of those groups. So if you have a lot of these filters that are using regular expressions and you have a dot there, okay, that means you might have to recheck okay, your current um, uh, policies, your current regular expressions, okay, um, because you've added a dot here and this might affect those regular expressions, those policies. So that's why um, we personally actually don't recommend the use of AS dot. AS plane is simple, okay, you can just stick with that. Now these are the usages of the different AS numbers. Some of them are reserved, some of them are used for public um, consumption, some of them are used for documentation purposes and therefore not available for, you don't see that in the AS number pool. Um, you have things that are used for private um, usages, maybe just if you have one-to-one -one direct peering um, between two, two networks, 
where this doesn't have to be uh, forwarded to the rest of the internet, then you use the private range. Now, this is the this first part is for the two bytes. Then we've added some more that would be used for the four byte um, um, four byte range. So you also have there things that are used for public, which is this one. It's a very big pool, and you also have um, those ranges that can be used for documentation purposes. Okay, so at least you have an idea which one will be useful for you. Uh, we normally just use the private address, uh, private private range. Okay, again for point to point. Um, or direct peering, direct connections. All right, uh, let's just skip that. I've pretty much discussed the differences between ESplane and ES. Dot. I'm just having a look whether there's something important that you need to remember here. Well, basically, we've already talked about most of it, and even the notation or how it's written down. AS dot, as I've said, is pretty useful. It's easy on the eyes, but it is. Um, it presents some difficulty when it comes to um, implementing policies through regular expressions. All right, so now uh, what about um, working the 16 bits and 32 bits together? How does it work? We have a special number. It's um, AS23456, which is used to represent a 32-bit ASN in a 16-bit world. So let's just say that you have, let's say, four or five networks, four or five routers. They're peering with each other. Um, some of them are using 16 bits. Some of them are using 32 bits. Okay. So wh what happens there is if I am using a 16-bit um, AS number and my, say, my iOS or my, yeah, my, my, my basically my router doesn't support four byte ASN. I can still peer with a network that is using 4 byte. But what I see in my route entries would be a series of AS23456. Remember what an AS path is? It's a direction. It gives us the hops that we need to take in order for us to send okay, a, a packet or send traffic to, let's say, our destination. If you are going to from A to D, Okay, we will specify each hop that is represented using the AS path, a list of all the autonomous system numbers used to hop to get to the destination. Now, what if um, one of my, say, from my router A is using 4 byte, but somewhere in between, I have all these 16-bit routers, okay, and then on the other end, my destination is also 32 bits. So on all these um, routers running 16 bits only, I can see a series of AS23456 there. So actually, if you are, uh, if you want a reason to migrate or to use 4 byte ASN rather than uh, 16 bits, so let's just say you already have, let's say, a 16 bit ASN, okay? So is there a reason for me to up, sort of upgrade or to use 32 bits? The answer is no, because it is still interoperable with the other networks okay, that are using 32-bit ASN. The only reason for you perhaps is uh, if you're going to buy new routers or if you're going to upgrade to new um, operating systems, then, of course, you have to make sure that it has already support for 4 byte ASN. And if you do that, and then you deploy that, then you might want to use a 4 byte ASN, right? Um, another thing is, um, if you want to see all the path that is used in the AS path attribute in your PHP, then, of course, you might want to use 4 bytes. Why? Because um, if you have, let's say, you're doing troubleshooting, you have a, a, a route entry, a route prefix for this IP address block, and you have, let's say, about 10 hops to get to the destination. But most of them are using 4 bytes, so you only see 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a series of them. So you don't have an explicit view of the path, okay? you It's somehow vague because you don't know which networks your, uh, uh, your packet is hopping into, okay? So yeah.
um, that's may, may, maybe one reason why you would want to use 32 bits rather than 16 bits. Otherwise, when we talk about interoperability, will it still function the same and, and those kind of questions, of course, it wouldn't affect um, um, much of it, okay? It can still work. And that works because of this special number, AS23456, that we are now using to represent a 32-bit ASN in a 16-bit world. All right, so that is essentially the end of this presentation. Uh, it's a very uh, short one, um, just an introduction to what we use the ASN and how it's useful for us because we give a lot of um, focus on IP addresses, but I see that um, a lot of people are still not aware of um, AS numbers and how to use them and all that. All right, so um, Caleb, do you have any questions? I think I've already answered most of the questions that you put in there, right? All right, my, the video is dropping out a bit. Well, if you want a copy of the video, I might be able to post it later on. But I think it ha we also have uh, another presentation that's already uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you want to repeat this, then you can just have a look at youtube.com slash training. And we should have an equivalent one that discusses the same thing. All right. So, um, but my apologies for the um, video issues there. Now, I'm going to write the link to the survey just in case you want to fill this in for me. That's the link to the survey. And if you want a copy of the slides as well, you can get it after after the survey. You will be redirected straight away into our FTP page. Um, the YouTube channel that I was mentioning about is this and just try and grab that copy grab that link for you That's this one all right so if you um, have any questions maybe later on please feel free to send us an email to training at apnic.net and we'd be happy to help you out all right again thank you very much for joining